All right, welcome back to Net's series, Inspiration on Demand, Creators in Conversation. We took a month off, but I think we are all ready to dive back into hearing from incredible artists in our field. My name is Carrie J. Cole, and I am the board secretary of the Network of Ensemble Theaters. I'll do a brief visual description for those of you that um, need that description support. I'm a white human with short brown and gray hair and clear eyeglasses. I'm in my office with yellow walls and plants and watercolor paintings behind me. And I'm wearing a purple shirt and black earrings. I do use uh, she, her pronouns and want to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of not only the land of where I um, currently am, but across the country. I am zooming in from the lands of the Odom Druid, Tohon Odom, Esabupari, and Hohokam peoples in Tucson, Arizona. If you were with us three years ago, you were probably uh, preparing to go to Tucson at this very moment. Um, if you would like to participate in land acknowledgement with us today, please do so in the chat. We'll also drop a resource in the chat if you would like to engage and may need a resource. The very cool music that greeted us in the space was created by Net Ensemble member Open Flame Theater. It was a song titled Where Bones Grow. Open Flame Theater creates original multidisciplinary performances rooted in the queer trans experience. Through exploring the surreal and fantastic, they seek to liberate the imagination, which they recognize as a vital part of the larger struggle for justice and freedom. Big thanks to Open Flame for sharing their music with us to feature today. I also want to acknowledge my colleagues who will be supporting today on the chat and with tech needs, particularly as this is my first time hosting the Inspiration On Demand, Alicia Tonzik, who is our executive director, and Nicole Shero, our finance and operations manager. And I also want to do some quick access and logistics, particularly since weather may be affecting a number of us across the nation today. Um, if you have access needs, we are recording for future viewing and uh, we'll put a link on our site and our YouTube channel. The chat is enabled, but please keep in mind that even private chats will be viewed by net. If you have a need for closed captioning, please click the closed caption live transcript button for the toolbar uh, on the toolbar, excuse me, or put an ask for tech help in the chat and my colleagues can help out. If you want to change your view of this meeting, please go to the upper right hand corner for the speaker view. And as a short reminder of why we're doing this series. It is NET's 25th year birthday this year, and we wanted to create a space to come to get that spark of inspiration when you need it. We co-created this series with our incredible board members in hopes that we can offer a gift of inspiration to those here who live in our Zoom room, but also on demand for when you are able to share it for those watching a recording later on. We posed the question to our board, who are your mentors? Who are the artists you admire that inform and activate your own ensemble practice? We've also announced our next conversation, which will be our last conversation for the year. Um, we have Claudia Alec in conversation with Tyrone Davis, um, November 8th. You can check our, out our website for all the information and to register for those conversations too. Speaking of conversations, it is time for our conversation for today with these true, two extort, gotta try that again. Two extraordinary artists. I am so excited about this conversation. My tongue is tied. Um, I'm going to read just a sliver of our guest artist bios for people who may not be familiar with uh, you both, even though we know they are going to get to know you very soon. This is very abridged here, folks. These are incredible, incredible artists, and I'm honored to be here with them today. Uh, welcome to our guest, Carlton Turner. Carlton Turner is an artist, agriculturalist, researcher, and co-founder of the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production, SIP Culture. SIP Culture uses food and story to support rural community, cultural and economic development in his hometown of Utica, Mississippi, where his family has been for eight generations. Carlton is the former executive director of Alternate Roots and a founding partner of the Intercultural Leadership Institute. He currently serves on the boards of First Peoples Fund, Imagining America and Project South, 
and is an interdis interdisciplinary research fellow with the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation. With his brother Maurice Turner, Carlton co-founded Mugabe, Men Under Guidance, Acting Before Early Extinction, a performing arts group blending jazz, hip hop, spoken word poetry, and soul music together with non-traditional storytelling, one of the first ensembles I ever experienced as part of NET. Carlton was also in NET's early days, a member of NET's steering committee that then became the NET board. We dropped a link for SIP culture there in the chat. And to our NET board member, the amazing Shoshana Boss is boss, is boss. Shoshana Bass is co-artistic director of Sandglass Theater based in Putney, Vermont. Raised in a traveling family of internationally acclaimed puppeteers, she spent her life witnessing and in dialogue with artistic voices of diverse cultures, heritages, and perspectives, and now performs, directs, and choreographs internationally. As a rural-based artist touring frequently to cities, she is especially interested in rural advocacy and a national narrative towards justice. She works with puppets because they are provocative means of inviting story and containing metaphorical worlds. And the Sandglass Theater link was just dropped into the chat as well. With that said, Shoshana, I pass it to you to get us started. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, all the other uh, NET team that are on this call. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, and it was so great to hear Watkins' music in the beginning. What a wonderful feature. Um, and I am Shoshana, and I am tuning in today from the unceded lands of the Abenaki Wabanaki people in southern Vermont. Um, I am a, my image description, I am a white Ashkenazi woman with brown curly hair, and I am wearing a black shirt and a furry, comfy gray scarf because the seasons are turning here in Vermont and it is a little bit chilly. Um, I'm really excited today. Uh, when we were asked who we would like to talk to, Carlton was the first person to come to mind. I'm so excited that Carlton, that you said yes and you're joining me today for this conversation uh, because from my very first days before, um, becoming involved with Sandglass before stepping into any role of leadership. Um, you were already making an impression on my young life. I, uh, in my teenage days, had maybe 10 CDs. One of them was Mugabe that I listened to very often from when you came with Maurice to our theater and then later with your sister as well. Um, and we're working together with my parents who are on screen as well, Eric and Inez, hi. Um, and, and building bridges across the, from Mississippi to Vermont, which was beautiful. So I'd love you to introduce yourself as well, and then we'll get the conversation going. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Carlton Turner, uh, pronouns are he, him, his, uh, coming to you from um, the land of the Choctaw, the Yazoo, the Quapaw, and the Natchez people here in central Mississippi. Uh, and Mississippi is an Ojibwe word, uh, which means big river, great river. Uh, and I um, am at the about 25 minutes from the river. Um, really exciting to be here today. Um, I have to say, you know, I um, feel a little, a little elder in spirit today, uh, being introduced as, as in the early days of NET, <laughs> Carlton. Uh, but it's really good to see everyone here, especially folks that um, I remember from those very early meetings, folks like Sabrina and Eric and uh, Bob uh, and Alicia from those very early, early years. Um, but I'm really excited, really excited to be here and excited for the conversation. I don't have much more. Thanks, Carlton. Um, so as I've definitely called you about this before, and um, as was mentioned, I'm very interested in um, the role of rural arts 
in the world today and especially in the national dialogue. And so I got really excited about what you were doing with SIP culture. And I wondered if you would just give a little context and share a little bit more about what your work is in your local community, but also how, how it bridges within um, other communities and networks. Yeah, so um, as it was mentioned in my bio, um, my, most of my, um, most of my adult career has been with an organization called Alternate Roots. Um, big shout out to Bob Leonard, who's one of the founding members of that organization, founded at the Highlander Research and Education Center in 1976, um, and has been an organization that I feel like has been on uh, the cutting edge of arts, culture, and social justice for its entire um, existence. And um, in, the, in the last decade or so has really been a, a, a premier leader in the field, um, having been at that organization to receive both an education and understanding what community-based work looked like when done with integrity and intention uh, and held to a strict sense of, of values uh, that were rooted in, in place, tradition, and spirit. Um, I thought a lot about my home community, um, which I never left, even though I worked for Alternate Roots for 14 years, um, I never, never moved away from Mississippi, never moved away from the community that my family uh, has been in for a very long time. Um, and so I thought a lot about how the work that I've been invited to do in so many communities, including Putney and, um, and Blacksburg and um, you know, all types of places uh, across the country, um, I thought about what does that work look like in my home community? Because as an adult, I had never done this community-based work in my own home, uh, mostly because the, the, the opportunities have all been offered um, in places that weren't my, my community. Um, and the way to both uh, do the work that I felt like was most important to me and to be able to make a living to support my family um, always drew me out of my community. Uh, and so really was conscious about what does it mean to, um, to return and be uh, and do the work that I've done for the, the bulk of my adult life and the place that really is responsible for creating the person that I am today um, and continues to be the, the home of my family and, and my, my, my rooted community. So we created, uh, my wife and I, Brandy, we've been together for uh, coming up on 25 years and um, we decided to create this organization um, actually to create a process. Um, and the process was to engage our community in conversations about our well-being, uh, our health and wellness, and to you utilize or at least to offer our skills and, and connectivity and our networks and our resources to an ongoing conversation about what it means for a community to be engaged in its own development. Um, you know, thinking about community development as something that usually happens to community and rarely is something that the community is participating in as an active, um, as, an, as an agent, as someone who has agency in the process of decision-making and in planning and in thinking about what the future holds for the community. Uh, and so we, developed this idea um, of, of creating this space which uses food and story as the leverage points for um, community development and thinking about community development in its most comprehensive uh, and, and largest ideas. Um, what does it mean to think about the culture of our community? What does it think, mean to think about the social health of our community, the, the physical health and wellness, um, the financial and economic health and wellness? Um, and how do we create a process that allows for all of those ideas to breathe through it and, and, and lend, lend all of those, their ideas and dreams to this comprehensive collection of, um, of just future making that we're doing here in, in, in SIP culture. Uh, with that, and I'll be really brief, I, I know I've probably taken too much time with this answer, but um, we want to, we, we have three spaces that we operate out of. So we have an artist residency and office space, which I'm you know, in right now as I take this call, which can house up to six artists at a time. Um, and it's our residency space. We're on one and a half acres of land here. Um, and we have a 4,000 square foot 
a building on Main Street, which uh, we're developing with a, with a de community development partner into a commercial kitchen um, and cultural center, which will open uh, in the spring of 2023. And then we have 17 acres of green space that we've turned into our SIP culture community farm, which hosts um, a, both a community farm, but also is a part of our programming of um, small farm apprenticeship in which we're training uh, young black farmers in sustainable agriculture. Uh, and so those are some of the, the pieces that we have. Um, we're, we're dealing with food apartheid in our community. And so food and story became kind of like the hook for us to uh, engage people, attract people, and keep people engaged in the conversation over time. I love what you're saying about roots. And I felt um, as a youngish person here, there was a lot of pressure to like move away because I live in a rural area. So if I wanted to have a career or to get out in the world, like it was to do the, the legitimate work, I needed to leave my hometown which I did for, for about five years and then <laughs> realized that um, the, the place I know the best is my hometown and therefore that's the place I can make the most difference. And uh, also the work that my parents were doing was the work I was most interested in. So <laughs> I moved back, but there was a lot of, and, and even now, so I, I'm, a, I'm an odd demographic in my hometown because people move back to have families um, Vermont has a very aging population, a lot of seniors and a lot of young kids, but not a lot of people, uh, single, single family people uh, around my age, because there's just such a culture around uh, leave, leaving. And so it's really beautiful and inspiring for me and has um, been an important mm, maybe paradigm shift for me to really acknowledge that shifts and changes that I can and have the capacity to make are in the places I know the best and that's here. Um, and those relationships are so bolstered and encouraged by the national networks and international relationships that we have. So there's, there's this like two side thing where the deep roots here in this community and the relationship building here is so important and they're also made strengthened by the organizations like NET or places that have brought you, for example, Carlton, into our community to work in a way that's um, very transformational and personal because we're such a small community. And so anything that comes in is you know, kind of part of the family <laughs> um, or goes into the schools where we know the families of which the children are coming from. So I, I love hearing that there's eight generations of your family in your hometown and you remain there to do the work there because you know the needs most of all that exist there. That's really beautiful. I also find there's such a different way of speaking about rural communities are so, I mean, they're not a monolith, first of all, your rural community and my rural community are, very different in many ways, but there, I think there are some things that are shared um, and I'm curious about how we uplift what's unique about what we have to offer, what kind of opportunities exist within our communities for people who come in to work as a guest artist that's come here to work in our community or having hosted people in your community. Uh, what's, what's specifically different than going to a rural, uh, to an urban area? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, just right off the bat, you know, just thinking about both my time here and what, what just about everybody, every artist that comes to the space says is, it's so quiet and peaceful. Um, and peace and quiet uh, is, is, is a gift in, in these times, as, especially as our lives are always so busy um, we're constantly being um, bombarded with information, with, with just this idea that our lives have to move at a pace that is completely unrealistic and unsustainable, right? But that is the norm um, in a capitalist driven society that production is, is like, you gotta be producing something, you know? 
And, and most of what we're producing is just waste. It's not, not a lot of, you know, we're not producing a lot of like just good stuff. It's mostly waste. We, we produced a few good things, but people come here and they say, oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's peaceful. It's quiet. And it's expansive. I feel like I can breathe. Um, and all of those things are really important to an artist uh, in any stage of their career that is trying to unclutter their, their thought process and get to the, the crux of the thing that they're trying to do. And so I think that that's first and foremost what, what we offer. Um, I don't know that the second piece is, is, is unique, um, but um, in our community, you also getting eight generations of relationships that you're, that you're coming into, right? So you're not, you know, you know, I can go into any city and you can find a lot of, of convenience. You know, you can get food from all these different countries and, and you can go shopping at all these retail stores and get things that you may not be able to have access to in a rural setting. But in my community, when you come in, you've been grandfathered or grandmothered into eight generations of relationships which means that you're coming in on, on you, you're giving kind of like this, this entree into just do what you gotta do. We, this, this community is vouching for you and we got space, we built space in this, in this organization within this community for you to just do your work. And um, that's a really lovely, lovely idea. Um, we also are really interested in what it means for rural artists, specifically rural artists in a Southern context to have a rural space for their work to be developed in. And the reason why that's so important is because I feel like all of the opportunities that I've had as an artist to develop work, to develop new work, to think about production and, and, and taking an idea to its, uh, to its fruition have all come in urban spaces but I'm a rural artist and I've never been in the rules. You know, I've been to Sandglass many times, uh, but I wasn't going there to, to, to develop work. I was going there to show work. Um, the places that have been there to help me develop work have all been urban spaces. And so we wondered what, what how to, has that had an impact on um, the way that we tell stories, the type of stories that we feel are appropriate because we're no longer in places that resemble our home or, or you know, or resemble that place that makes us feel comfortable. Um, so we wanted to create a rural space that, that was designed for rural artists to be able to do their work in rural settings, you know, um, and, and see what it means for those artists to be nurtured with the same type of support structures and resources in a context that is, uh, that reminds them of home. You know, and that's uh, that's what really was the the, the guiding uh, force be behind this residency program. I love that so much, and it makes so much sense. <laughs> but I I agree that we it it doesn't look that way on the surface. So I'm curious why why is that important on a national level? Like, why is it important yeah. that that we include those stories? Why does why does an artist who's from an urban area going to a, a rural area matter? Why does a rural artist going to an urban area matter? What, yeah. Yeah, I, I, and I would just say simply, you know, public policy is shaped by the way that we see people. You know, laws are made by, they're made based on the way that we perceive. And so when you have stories that are, are missing from, from the larger canon, when you have stories that are missing from the public sphere, um, you know, then, and even when those stories are there, but told by people who don't own the stories is a challenge. You know, those are, those are not, you know, when, you, when the only stories that you know from Mississippi are from someone that is not from Mississippi telling those stories, then, then there's, a, there's a lack of authenticity in that story. And, and so you, not just the authenticity, but the first person, when you, I, will, I grew up as a, you know, I came into this work as a community organizer, you know, and I feel like the, the best, the artists that I admire the most are artists that are rooted in community organizing practices. Um, 
And the first tenet of community organizing is that those that are closest to the problems are, are the best to identify and, and understand the solution. It's what the whole idea of subculture is built around that our community knows best what it needs to do for itself. What it needs is an opportunity to collectively think and begin to, to unpack what it means to be, in, um, be an agent of its own future. And so when I think about this work, uh, when I think about why these voices are important and necessary is because you know, we're not getting the type of, of, of responsive legislation and policies at all levels um, that are benefiting the communities that we are a part of. And it's because our communities aren't a part of the narrative. Um, they're only a part of, they're, they're basically receiving, they're, they're on the receiving end of legislation. They're not on the defining end. And the defining end is where it's, it's what really matters. It's, it's who's writing policy and, and who is the policy being written for. Um, and so that's why the voices of, of rural communities aren't more important than urban, but they're equally as important. And so when, when those voices are missing from the larger canon, then we have a deficit in, in the quality of policy and laws that are shaping our collective narrative as, as a country and as a world. Yeah, another experience that I've had um, that I feel is specifically, feels specifically unique to, to performing in a rural area or, or organizing or any kind of community um, engagement work is that there, are, in, an, in an urban setting where you have lots of choices to go to wherever you want any given night, um, you can very much go to where you're politically comfortable, identity-wise comfortable, like in every, uh, you have, there's something for everyone. And um, something that's interesting here is that if there's one thing happening, most, many, many people are there from very different political perspectives and in conversation. So there's something easier about gathering with opposing views and having to sort it out. Uh, or not sorted out. It's not perfect, and there's definitely still division and um, and conflict. But but there is an immediacy to it because uh, you know your neighbor needs to plow out your driveway for you, so you got to get along. So <laughs> there there is a closeness to how a community works together and has to work some things out and be with folks that may think differently. Um, that I find really an, a really interesting aspect of a, of a smaller area. So, yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a challenge in our community. That's that's a primary challenge because so much of our public infrastructure in our community has been decimated, um, and and so we live in a community that when I grew up, um, some you know thirty five years ago. Um, the community produced 80 to 90% of its own food. Everybody had gardens, everybody raised, you know, livestock and, and everything came from the community. So if, so your food didn't have far to travel. And, and in the same community today, um, there's no grocery store. And even though 40 years ago, the grocery store was important, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, an essential necessity. It was yeah, we go there too to get those few things that we can't make on our own. But at, you know, over that time, the grocery store became essential because, because jobs and, and, and the demands of life shifted people off of the farms and off of localized small farm production and into these you know, um, blue collar and white collar jobs. And the grocery store became essential and then it vanished. And so now, the what people have is a dollar general you know a community that used to have all organic all you know fresh produce and and, and livestock and 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 wild game now you know the the first option is dollar general um and have to travel 25 miles one way to get to a grocery store so what has happened as a result of that is a result of losing so many of the public infrastructure we lost high schools, two high schools, we lost a grocery store, we lost most of the businesses on Main Street. And when you begin to lose those spaces, you're not just losing economic spaces. You're also losing what you were just talking about, Shoshi, which is those spaces that are also part of the social fabric of the community. 
They're the space when you go into the grocery store and you run into someone, you didn't schedule a meeting, you, you didn't have any intention on talking to this person, but you saw them in the, in the grocery store and all of a sudden you ask how their mother is doing. And then you, you get into a conversation on the cereal aisle and next thing you know, you've gotten, you've gotten a rundown on what's happened in this person's life and how those things are impacting various aspects of the community. And that becomes, that's, that's happening all around you because all of these spaces, these economic spaces are, and educational spaces and manufacturing spaces also double as social spaces. So when you lose all of those things, the community has to, it's forced to retreat into its own little spaces, little, you know, these little fiefdoms and the interconnectivity that used to be the hallmark of the community now is the detriment of the community because now things can happen to the community before the community even knows it's happening. And so what we're recognizing is that in order to do this work, in order to do the long-term work of community development, we have to start with repairing social spaces. And those social spaces look like spaces where people of any political identity, any gender identity, any economic identity, any social identity, can come and feel like there's something that they need here or something that they desire here. And so that's the spaces that we're working to develop first. And then to move into spaces where we can begin to, to rebuild the muscle of, of collective conversation through story. Then we can begin to see what it means to be um, agents of change together and have those difficult conversations. Right now, we can't even have the difficult conversation because our people aren't even in the same spaces. I'm writing down, rebuild the muscle of collective story. Love that. Um, I, I wanna switch gears a little bit and just cause we're here with this net community and ask you a little bit of, um, cause the first, when Eric and I first started having conversations about leadership at Sandglass and what this might look like. And I was learning puppet shows from my mother that I performed with my sister and all this was starting to percolate. Um, the first place in terms of network that Eric took me was to the main net gathering. I think it was in Maine. Yeah, main net gathering um, where I first started to meet and I met Jerry Stropnicki there who then directed my solo show and all the relationships started to build and, and Carlton I'd met you before that um, and then understood greater what this whole organization was and how it actually had really influenced the work that was happening at Sandglass and um, how, how we were developing and had developed from this history. So I'm curious to hear a little bit as someone who, um, sorry to, to position you as an elder again, but as someone who was there from the beginning steering committee, um, how did this organization impact your journey along the way? Oh man, uh, tremendously. You know, I remember, um... I remember going to that first meeting that I went to, which was in, um, where was it? Um, what was it? Amherst? Amherst, yes, it was in Amherst. And, um, and meeting, you know, uh, Eric and, and Sabrina and Jerry Stropnicki and, and so many other folks. And I think that's where I met Universes the first time. Um, you know, um, Mildred and Steve uh, was at that gathering. and. And um, I already knew Bob and I knew Dudley Cock who was also there. And um, I can't remember if John O'Neill was there or not, um, but Sterling Houston was there. Wasn't Sterling Houston there? From San, Glad, from, uh, from San Antonio, from um, Jumpstart. I knew, I knew some of those people through the Roots Network. So Roots is very intertwined. You know, it's, it intertwines with a lot of different networks. So. Uh, Roots intertwines with NET and Roots intertwine with the, you know, um, American Festival Project and with NPN. And so um, because I came through Roots, I had a kind of like a, a orientation to understand a lot of these spaces. And in that space, I remember that year being this kind of like impetus from 
from Roberta Uno that, you know, if, if net is going to be relevant, it has to diversify. It can't be the all white society. And, and I remember coming in on that conversation and really being there because of that conversation. Uh, and, and for some reason, you know, leaving the meeting, <laughs> having signed up to do work. And I don't know, you know, what really happened in the meantime, but um, what I do remember is seeing um, Eric's piece, and I don't remember the name of the piece, but it was a beautiful piece about keys and these, you know, it was done on this very small stage. Um, and I remember having the conversation after that show and I was like, this work is beautiful. It is absolutely gorgeous. And I could never bring it to my community. And I remember Eric saying, why? I said, because it requires so much um, to, to be prepared to understand and receive this type of work that my community isn't there yet. And, and, and we began this like really thoughtful, deep conversation about about our communities and how aesthetics were connected to the way that we saw our work, the way that our work could evolve. And, and just this really beautiful relationship flowered because of that. And, and, and I consider Eric to be a dear friend and, and it's, you know, to be, these are family, this is family folks, your family. And, and we began this exchange because we knew that there was so much that we had to learn from each other. And to me, that is the, that is the beauty of the network. It's not, the opportunities to perform, but this, this deep engagement and learning that happens when you bring people out of these spaces that um, don't necessarily know um, what to make of each other. You know, it's like, I don't know, I know there's something here and it's the willingness to learn, the willingness to listen and grow that really made it valuable. So, you know, going to Blacksburg and being with, with uh, Bob, many, you know, being brought in multiple times, it's this idea of recurring relationships, this, this re reciprocity that happens when you go back and, and be in a community multiple times. Uh, and that happened through net, you know, going to carpet bag and being in that space, you know, over and over again, having uh, these organizations adopt our company, adopt our performance and, and be interested in, the, in what we had to offer. And, you know, I didn't even consider myself to be an ensemble member or part of an ensemble. I was like, you know, oh, that's theater. Me and my brother, we do music. We're, you know, we're over here doing this stuff. We're, and it was Linda Paris Bailey that said, no, no, you're an ensemble. The two of you have been creating a body of work together over time. And that's what ensemble, you know, was meaning for her. And that's what she shared with us. And, and I just feel like NET has, NET helped me to understand um, my own work in greater context. And it helped me to, to have access to the brilliant genius of people like Marty and, and Eric and, and all of these folks that have, Sabrina and the work that was happening with the co-festival. These are all places that have contributed to my understanding of, of my own work, but also the understanding of the importance of the diversity of work that has to be presented in order for us as a society to have a holistic view of, of, the, of the world that we live in and begin to, to, to come up with holistic solutions to these challenges. Don't stress it, just bless it. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Mugabe Show. Um, yeah. <laughs> comes up for me every now and then yes. I say that. <laughs> just bless it, baby. Uh, I love, love what you just said. And for us, it's such, it is, I, I sometimes refer to it as a lifeline because I feel it is so absolutely essential to us, especially um, in, in how we serve our community as a um, predominantly white organization in a community that has a, a small, vibrant community of color that doesn't have these we can't make the shows that that will really serve the needs that exist for that community but we have the network of artists that we can bring to really offer safer space for those conversations to happen and offer the support of all that community and what i love is so much of the artists that i've met through this have such a community organizing element of what they do and there's so much of an understanding of the the, what happens around a performance that ripples into a community, not just the art itself, 
but it's a like you were saying a holistic um, experience and so for us it's these these connections have helped us to serve our community so much better in a way that feels um, authentic and feels generative and feels like it's the it's a growing thing not a transactional moment also, in time yeah i'll just say also i'm sorry for interrupting um uh the the dollars the small grant dollars that were available through net that made a lot of exchanges possible like like to learn with another company to 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 be to spend like real time developing a body of work with another company uh, that kind of intimate engagement and relationship development has had a tremendous amount of impact on on my work you know i feel like between alternate roots and npn and the network of ensemble theaters it also prepared me to serve the arts community right not just to not just to, to to take from the arts community or like to benefit from it but to be in service to it uh, and that includes being in service on the net board being in service on panels at the nea uh, being in, in panels you know serving on the um the uh the the national theater project where a number of net programs, uh, net artists and companies have been funded that, that work through there, sitting on that advisory committee for six years and being able to speak on behalf of these net companies that come through the process to say, no, I know that company, this is what their work is about. And this is who they are. And this is what they're doing in their home. And, you know, and that has, you know, that's a that's a service to to the community of net, but it's also a service to the field to make sure that these ensembles and these smaller companies and these organizations are getting the opportunities and exposure and resources necessary to begin to shift the, the national conversation. And I think NET has had that kind of impact uh, over its, its, its life. It, is, it has impacted the, the, this idea of ensemble theater uh, that at one point was just kind of regulated, regulated as, as, a, as a sideshow, you know, not really the hardcore theater work, to being a process that has been embraced across many different sectors. And that's because of the, the advocacy of, of NET. And that's a really important benefit to, to all of our work, that our work is legitimized and validated in these larger spheres. So, um, you know, big shout out to, to the work of NET and just sticking to that game for so long. And I'd also say though that I felt held accountable to my work too, in that context, in a really important way that has, um, that is loving, <laughs> yeah. I think, in a way that I can, uh, I am a, a stepping into a position, stepping into a place, and I feel so bolstered by knowing that I can reach out to all these amazing artists um, because that ethos uh, of, of mutual aid is so strong. So I really, yeah, if that's, it's, I couldn't imagine stepping into this pos position without this network and the NPN network and these kind Absolutely. of larger networks, especially in a rural context where there isn't a whole lot of people doing this work where I live. So that's just so beautiful. Um, I just, before we move to questions, cause you're speaking towards it a little bit and I'm very much future focused right now in terms of like the best possible worlds we can possibly imagine and wanting to manifest it. So I'm just curious um, as someone having gone through that lineage of um, all of this, of, to just speak a vision forward in terms of the national ensemble theater community, but also how it ripples out um, and, and what that might look like in its most beautiful manifestation. Yeah, I think um, I think when it's when the work is mature, it finds space to, to both be grounded and 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 strong in its identity. So it's clear what it is, like net is clear what it is as an organization. And it finds room to 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 encompass more, you know, and I think that that's what net has demonstrated you know, over the last decade is, is, is knowing who it is, knowing, knowing what the practice is and, and the, the, the really what the, the tenets are and the values of, of the work that it wants to uphold. 
and also finding space to make sure that you know, artists that are coming from, um, oh, just to shout back out to that, that original meeting. I also met people like uh, Spider Women, um, Woman um, Theater, um, met folks from, um, there, there was a very, very uh, Santa Fe, Mexi New Mexico. Um, I forget the name of the theater. What was it, Sabrina? Theater Grotesco, John. Theater Fox. Grotesco. So many amazing um, organizations that were there, but finding, you know, this, being rooted and grounded in, in its identity, but also finding space to be more expansive. And I think that that's when our work is at its best, when it doesn't, it doesn't look to exclude, but looks to figure out ways to include and, and be as relevant um, to as much work as possible while staying grounded in its identity and not getting lost. I love that. Carrie, were you gonna jump in? I was. I, we just have a few uh, minutes left for questions. I uh, got so wrapped up in the uh, amazing conversation. Um, uh, I lost track of time. My apologies. Um, so if you have a, a question for Carlton and Shoshana, um, please feel free to drop it in the chat or uh, go ahead and, and um, unmute. We're sm a small enough group that I think we can do that in a collaborative and supportive manner. Um, if anybody has any questions. I see, Bob, uh, you've unmuted. Do you have a question or a comment for our two amazing colleagues? No, I just was going to say, I think uh, Rodessa Jones was at that meeting in uh, Amherst as well. Yes. Uh, Oh, that's fabulous. One of the things that I love about the fact that we're recording these is I, I couldn't write fast enough. So I've written notes of, okay, Carlton is saying really brilliant things 39 minutes into this recording. So I can go back and look at it later on our, um, uh, on our website and on our social media. Um, I think that there's so much that is uh, so beautiful about this, this naming and this legacy. Um, but that, that um, I did write down, uh, Shoshi, that idea of speaking of vision forward um, and that phrasing I find um, so beautiful and so, so generous. I'm gonna be thinking about that all, all day. Um, uh, I did have a question, I have to find it. Um, and that, um, it actually has to do with, uh, for both of you, uh, I, I grew up in a rural community. I've lived um, uh, rural and um, uh, urban in uh, several areas of the US, except for the South, uh, Carlton. Um, uh, and uh, I have recently been struggling with um, uh, feeling like a, a rural community has been closed to me because of, um, of my identity, um, of, <laughs> of being um, an educated uh, single woman in a rural community that is very much family oriented um, uh, and very um, uh, anti arts and education. And I, I would love uh, just a seed of of uh, a vision for a future that you that might give me some hope for um, uh, breaking down some barriers there, particularly over the past few years, um, uh, as we've seen that rural and urban divide politically. Either of you would be great. Um, so I'll uh, I'll keep mine really brief. Um, I think. Um, one of the things that I had to challenge myself with in terms of coming back to my, my home community is um, one, that everybody's participating in art, right? It's not a, it's not a theater only folks or you know, it has to look like this. And I think the entry point that, the entry points that I found most successful is to um, first understand um, what art practices are, are abundant in those rural communities. Um, and to, to unpack your experience and your entry points through, through those things, right? Because you know people may not see your work or see you first, um, but if you see them first, then they acknowledge you. Uh, and I think that uh, connecting to the art and culture as it exists in those, in those communities um, you know, and, and recognizing and, and, and creating the, the space to enter on those terms 
could possibly open more more gates than it shuts. Yeah, and I would add, well, first of all, that I, I feel everything is about personal relationships and everything is about um, building those. And to go back to something Carlton introduced in the very beginning about subculture is there's nothing like a meal or food and sharing food and gathering people around food. And I learned this also from my mother who is the hostess with the mostest and always understood that this was an essential part of gathering for any part of our, our festival and, and um, guest artists and welcoming people into the community and talking to people in the community. So I think that it was such a brilliant piece of um, what you introduced in the middle, in the beginning, Carlton, because I think um, that it's so, so true and that art and food somehow really need each other <laughs> and go together. Yeah, just like those cheese sandwiches your parents used to fix us, you know, before we go out for a long day. <laughs> Food is so important, uh, and thank you for reminding me of that uh, very strong connection I do have with that community. Um, speaking of SIP, we have a question from Marty Pottinger um, for you, Carlton, and that is, um, how has SIP's relationship with municipal government and or elected officials developed so far? Our government is a mess, uh, and I'm sure, Marty, you already know this, you, 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 you tended to keep your finger on the pulse um, you know, we're, we have a mess. Um, Mississippi is both the home of the, the most black elected officials in the country. Um, and we've had black folks running communities all up and down the, the state for, for, for generations. Um, and they act just like white folks that are in those positions. And it's the most dangerous concoction of, of cultural dysfunction uh, that I could imagine. Um, locally, our elected officials, the mayor um, is very appreciative of the work that we do here, uh, deeply engaged. Um, we try to be present at as many of the, the town hall meetings as possible. Um, we you know, go with, to them with all of our ideas and, and opportunities so to make sure that they have access to them. Um, but there's also zero resources. So the, the, that relationship is just about validation. Um, very few uh, resources outside of uh, just a head nod to say, yeah, uh, we're not gonna get in your way, uh, which is valuable in and of itself. Um, but it's, it's, really, it's really a challenge. Uh, we have not had much success yet with um, just building deep relationships with, with people in government here in the state of Mississippi or in the county. Uh, we have a, a few people that are on our, like, you know, in our corner, um, but it's just not a, it's not a fruitful space. It's not a generative space right now. And we'll continue to press on those spaces, but we, we also want to do as much of our work um, that doesn't rely on, on their, um, on their cooperation as possible. That's, uh, it sounds like a lot of um, planting left before you harvest there, if I can go to the, the agricultural metaphor that Carlson said, I think there's so much joy in the planting of it too, isn't there? Yeah. yeah that's great. We just have a couple of minutes left um, for me to uh, thank Shoshana and Carlton for this amazing conversation that has given me so much energy. It's one of the things that I find uh, so joyous about this series that we've created. Um, and I also want to rem remind people that if you're not currently uh, up to date with your membership dues or you're new to net, we are um, extending our pay what you uh, decide membership. So you can join us here at net at the price point that is available to you. We'll put that link in the chat. Um, and if there are individuals and ensembles in your community uh, and uh, think expansively on, of ensembles, the, those organizations that are working in that uh, ethos of mutual aid, um, invite them to join NET and uh, share that link with them. I think that would be a great way to um, expand our, our conversation and our culture. One final reminder, um, engage with us on our social media. We'll put those links um, as well in the chat 
but we are net ensembles at on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Shoshi Carlton, uh, and everybody who's uh, joined us uh, to uh, it really grapple with these ideas and move things forward in our community. Um, be safe, be well, uh, be generous with your spirit uh, to yourself and others, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.